Good morning to you. My name is Marco Johnson. I'm the lead pastor here. And uh, it is awesome, awesome, awesome having you with us as we continue the third week of our Staycation series. How many of y'all been enjoying this series so far? It's been an awesome, awesome series. And, and before we actually continue today's service, I, I want to take a moment and welcome those that are watching online. This is the second week of our online service at Vibrant Church. And if you happen to be online, we are, thank you. We, we are, we are glad to have you with us at service today. And so anyways, as we continue today's service, we are super excited. And also, I want to... Is that a fire alarm going off? <laughs> Hey, ushers, exit strategy <laughs> that we don't have in place. <laughs> kidding, kidding. There's a fire exit right there, exit right there. I feel like a flight attendant. Anyways, um, I do want to take a moment and just say a happy Father's Day. I know that each one of us has said that as we got up here. But dads, I want you to know this, that by God, designed by God, you play a vital role in your family. In fact, you are, according to the Bible, the leader of your home. Your wife is not the leader of your home. You are the leader of your home. And let me just say this. There's nothing more that your family needs or wants than you to be the godly man that God created you to be. You want to you wanna have your wife's heart. You want to have your children's hearts. Be the man that God created you to be. And I'm telling you, when all of that is in order, guess what? Your family gets in order, and it becomes what God created it to be as well. And so what I want to do is I want to pray a special prayer over you, and I want to pray this over all men in our congregation today. So if you happen to be a father or you happen to be a man in here, go ahead and stand. I want to pray for you real quick. So y'all go ahead and go ahead and stand. Come on, men, stand. And let me pray with you. Father, we love you. We thank you for today. God, I thank you for these men standing here. I pray your blessing over them. God, I pray your anointing over them. Lord, that we would be the men that you've called us to be to lead our homes, to lead ourselves. Most importantly, sometimes we, we need to lead ourselves. And when we lead ourselves correctly, everything else falls into place. God, help us lead ourselves well. Help us put you first, God. Today, we make that declaration and we make that decision that, God, as men that you created us to be, we put you first. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Awesome. Can you give our dads a hand clap today? Awesome. And, uh, and just for you dads and men, we have uh, bomb pops outside after service because you are the bomb. You the bomb. <laughs> And so we have bomb pops for you and everyone at Vibrant Church today after service. But as we continue our staycation series, um, this series is about your local church and, and the perks of staying connected. Again, that key word, staying connected. We, we happen to live in a culture where commitment is something, well, if I feel like being committed, then I'll be committed. If I don't feel like being committed, well, there's other options out there. But there are benefits to staying committed to a local church. Let's take a look at our theme verse. If you can go ahead and throw that up on the screens. Psalms 92, 12 through 14, it says, The righteous will flourish. Say flourish. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted. Say that word planted. In the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age and they will stay fresh and green. Like I've said each, each time during this series, if you want to stay fresh in your relationship with God, if you want to get to, the, to the old, an old age and still being like, like, yo, I'm still ticking. I still got purpose in my life. God still has me on this planet to take as many people to heaven with me as I can before I die. You know what? I am still green. I don't know about you, but that's a goal that I would love to have as I'm sitting on my front porch swing one day when I'm old and green, just kind of looking back and reflecting with my wife going, hey, we, we had a good run, didn't we, baby? You know, And so we want to stay fresh and green. But the only way to do that is to stay connected in the house of the Lord. There's benefits. There's benefits to getting planted and staying connected. Today, what we're going to talk about, though, is we're going to talk about the benefit of worshiping together. 
of worshiping together. And, and there's multiple elements of worship. One of those, and we're going to talk about this, one of the elements of worship is gathering together as a church family and singing praises to God like we were. I was standing over here this morning, and I, and I just felt like God said, Marco, I love this church. Because honestly, I was, I was standing there going, I love hearing the voices sing to our God. And to be quite frank with you, I was standing there too, and, and I was just thinking about this. I, I love pastoring this church. I love, but it's one of the greatest joys that I have is pastoring this church, building relationships with you, and, and really what brings joy to my heart is when I watch you build relationships with other people. And I see people walk through our doors that may be new, and then all of a sudden they start getting involved, they meet people, they start growing in their relationship with God, and they start growing in their relationship with each other. And so it brings an absolute joy to my heart to see you do that. But I want to answer this question today. What is worship? I mean, just kind of as a whole, what is worship? How can we define really what worship is? Here's a practical definition. It's this. Worship is simply, it's expressing our love and gratitude to God for who he is, what he's done, and what he promises to do. What is the opposite of gratitude? Really, it's being critical. It's complaining, and, and a lot of times we let, we let critical things come out of our mouth. We let complaints co- come out of our mouth towards the very thing that God has put in our lives. And then all of a sudden, we're critical towards maybe this person, or we're critical towards this situation. And then all of a sudden, we turn and we lift up our hands. You know, God, we love you. We're, gra- we're grateful for you. But God is going, are you really? Are you really grateful for me? Because if you're really grateful for me, I allowed that to come into your life. Quit being critical. Quit complaining and quit grumbling about the very things that I have blessed you with in your life. In fact, fathers, dads, one of the most important things that we can do as dads is speak life and bring life into our home. We speak life. We speak life over our wife. We're not critical of her. We don't nag her. We don't put her down. We lift her up. We speak life over her. The Bible says that we wash our wives with the word of God, that we we cleanse her and we wash her by speaking the word of God over her. That's our role, is to bring life and to speak life into our homes. But worship is expressing our love and gratitude to God for who he is, what he's done, and what he promised to do. In fact, Jesus equips us with what the most important command is, is because the most important command has to do with making sure that God gets the worship he deserves. Let's take a look at Mark 12, 29 through 30. And this is Jesus speaking to you and to me. It says, the most important, what's the most important thing that that Jesus says? It's right here. The most important command of all is this one. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all of your strength. Marco, what's the most important thing that I can do as a follower of Jesus? The most important thing that you can do is be in love with God. I mean, I don't know about you, but there's things that come my way. There's things that maybe confuse me, or I don't see. There's just uncertainty. There's hurts. There's, there's wounds that happen, but there's something powerful about just getting into the presence of God. This morning when I woke up, I, I, one of the things, my son, every morning I wake up, we get up, we give him his bottle, we do a little Devo, then we turn on uh, YouTube, we turn on worship music. And, and this morning my son, he's just kind of standing there in front of the TV like, all right, daddy, you know, like, can you turn the TV on? I'm ready to get my worship on, you know. But that is one of the most important things that we can do is is be worshipers. And this morning, you know, as as we began worshiping and and just praising and singing worship out to God, uh, there's something that just things get lighter. Maybe you were you were carrying a load and then you begin just worshiping and focusing on God. Because the reality is, is the 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 closer we get to God, the smaller everything else gets in our lives. And maybe you came in here today and you came in here with a heavy heart. Maybe you came in here with some worries. Maybe you came in here some with some anxieties. The most powerful thing that you can do in worry is worship. The most powerful thing you can do in worry is worship your God and commit to him singing love and singing gratitude for who he is. See, one day, one day Jesus was asked, hey, what is the most important command? And Jesus answered, 
Love God. It's simple. Just, just love God. Love God spiritually. Love God mentally. Love God emotionally. Love God physically. And love God practically. Now, I want to ask this question as we continue. Why do we do this, though? Why do we express our love to God? Why do we do that? There's tons of reasons, but today I'll only want to give you three reasons why we express our love to God. The first reason we worship is this. Number one is because we were made to be loved by God. One of the most unfortunate things that especially our school systems today are teaching in our public school systems is, is the fact that they make us think that we are just slime plus time. You know, it's like, you know, you kind of happen out of this little thing that happened in this pool of water, and it kind of turned into this little tadpole, and it turned into a monkey, and then, hey, here we are. You know what I mean? That defeats the whole purpose of why God created you. By the way, when you read the Bible, you're, not, you're, you're reading something that in the, in, the writer, in the writer's minds and in their lives, it was already established that God was the creator of everything. And the reason that God created you was he created you and me because he wanted a family. He wanted to, to, he wanted to, to receive the glory and the worship that he deserves, but he wanted to love you. And he created you to love you. In fact, the Bible tells us that, that we were created by God for God, and we were created by him to worship him and for him to love us. It, it kind of it goes into the, the same thing where you know, when, if you want to be a parent in here, uh, maybe you still want to be a parent, but maybe you are a parent. Um, but the reality is, is that a lot of times, I know for my wife and I, we wanted to be parents because, man, we really felt like we had a lot of love in our heart to give to a child. And the same principle applies with God. Where did that, where did that desire to love, if, if you look at your children, there's like, there is a love inside of you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There is a love inside of you for that child that no, there's no other love except your love for that child. And that is the same way that God feels towards you and me. In fact, this morning, uh, we were getting ready for, for service, and, and my son, he's, he's starting to kind of talk a little bit, and, and, uh, and I just looked at my wife, and I said, I love hearing his voice. And in my wife's intuitiveness and in her wisdom and, and her connectedness to the Holy Spirit, she goes, like instantly, she goes, you know, Marco, if, if you love hearing his voice, imagine how much our Father in heaven loves hearing our voice. And I looked at her, and I was like, baby, that's good. Uh, you want to preach this morning? <laughs> you know, yeah. But it's so true. God just loves hearing your voice. He loves hearing your voice. And it's extremely simple. He loves hearing from you. When you're, you're driving down the highway, it's just you and yourself in the car. You're just, he loves hearing your voice. When you wake up in the morning, good morning, Lord. When you go to bed at night, good night, God. It was a good day. Today was the day that you've made. I re, I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Father, thank you so much for making today. He loves hearing your voice because you were made to be loved by God. First John 4, 19, it says, we love because God first loved us. God first loved you. God first loved you. And in return, we love him back. The second reason we worship is number two, because everything comes from God. Everything comes from God. The air we breathe, the sunshine, the heartbeat in our chest, our body, our spouse, our children, our money, the water we drink, the food that we eat, everything comes from God. But Marco, I work for that. I mean, I, I put together that resume. I worked hard to get that job. I worked hard to build my career. Who gave you the ability to do that? Who gave you breath in your lungs? Who gave you the heartbeat in your chest to go to that interview? Who gave you the brain to, to work and do your job and to do, make, you know, make that money and build that career and, and, and have a family? Who gave you that? That came from God and God alone. It came from the Lord. Everything comes from God. See, God is such a good God. And I want you to think about this perspective for a second. God is such a good God that he created you. But not only did he create you, God created the earth to sustain you. 
I mean, have you ever paused and thought about it for a second? Like, we go to Kroger and it's like, I want this, I want that, I want that. But you got to think about it for a second. Where did all this and that come from? It came from the earth. The food came from the earth to sustain us. God didn't just create you, but he loved you so much that he created a system to work that would sustain your life on this planet so that he could continue to love you, bring you into his family, and we can give him the worship that belongs to him. Check out this. Check out what King David in the Bible says after he receives the largest single offering in history that was worth about $300 million for the building of the temple in Jerusalem. How many of y'all would like an offering for Vibrant Church of $300 million? I mean, I'd be like, what? <laughs> you know? But this is what happened in, in the, the building of the temple in Jerusalem. The, the Israelites began to just bring in. They took up a big offering and they wanted to build the temple to, to, to worship God in. And when they were doing this and they, they announced this to, to all of uh, the Israelites, they began to bring finances. They began, began to bring... By the way, let me just say this. If talking about money in the church is an issue for you, you do not understand lordship. You do not understand that everything comes from God, including our money, including our resources, including our family, and including our jobs. It all belongs to God. God just says, hey, you can have 90% of it. I just want you to be faithful with the 10% because honestly, I just want to test your heart. That's preaching right there. My name is Marco Johnson and I'm your friend. But here's what King David says after he receives the $300 million offering. It says this in 1 Chronicles 29, 14. It says, these gifts did not really come from me and my people. David understood this. He said, yeah, we brought all of this in. We, we brought this gold. We brought these incense. We brought this money to build the temple. We bought, brought this stone and these resources and these types of wood. We brought all of this in. But now that we think about it, who gave all of us this stuff to bring it in? God, you did. You gave all of this. And so David says, these gifts did not really come from me and my people. Everything comes from you, Father. We can only give back to you what you have given us. Everything comes from God. This is the second reason that we worship him. The third reason we worship God is because we understand life through worship. We understand life through worship. Every time we focus on God, every time we silence what's going on around us and we put our attention on who God is, what he's done and what he promised to do, promised to do, life becomes clearer. And that's why I want to strongly encourage you, man, don't make a major decision in life until you have prayed until you have fasted, and until you've really, seek, really sought out wise counsel and the clarity of God. God works through all of those things. He works through prayer. He works through fasting. He works through other godly counsel to make things crystal clear for you. Because I'm telling you, when you make a major God decision in your life, you are going to, know, you are going to need to know your why. You're going to need to know why you did that and why you, when we went, let me just say this, when we went from over in the Keller area to Saginaw, I was like, God, that's a little bit of a ways. Like, why are you calling us over here? And God began to confirm in multiple ways why we needed to move and to buy this facility and plant this church. As a matter of fact, he did it in three ways. And you know what? Even to this day, I still draw on those whys of God. I'm driving to church in the morning. God, thank you for the city of Saginaw. God, thank you for our community. Thank you for our church. Driving by the churches. God, bless that pastor. Bless that congregation. Bless your people. God, let us be a light in this community for you because God, you called us here. You called us here. And by the way, church, you have an incredible opportunity. You have an incredible opportunity to pave the way for people that aren't even here yet. And at the end of the day, that is what our purpose on this planet ultimately is. On the, when we get to the end of our day, when we're sitting on our deathbed, 
I've had the opportunity to sit with people as they were passing away from this life and about to go into the next. And, and I've never had one person go, Pastor, can you do me a favor? Can you go get my Roth IRA? Can you go get my 401k? And, and just print up all my bank statements. Man, can you do me a, fa- can you do me a favor? Can you go hook my boat up and, and put it out in the hospital parking lot? Because I just want to look down and see it one more time. No person has ever done that. What they do is say, Pastor, will you pray for me? Pastor, I, I want to see my family. Pastor, I, I made some, some tough decisions that I need to make right. Can you help me make those, those decisions right? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. At the end of the day, our purpose on this planet is to glorify God, to bring glory to Him, and provide a path for other people to know about Jesus Christ. If you want to be fulfilled in your life, man, get outside of yourself. Start serving in the church. Get involved in a group. Get connected to the church and and reach the people at your job. Reach the people in our community. Uh, Reach the people that God puts around you. Our goal is to take as many people to heaven with us as we can. But as we're, as we're trying to get understanding with what God has for us and trying to get that clarity, I want you to know this. If you can bring up the, the next slide. The timing of what you are praying for is just as important as the thing you are praying for. Marco, I'm waiting on this miracle. Your miracle's coming. Marco, I'm believing God for this because this is what he says in his word. If it's not good, then God's not done. God is going to work it out. But I'm just saying this. The timing of what you're praying for, the timing of what you see crystal clearly about, and maybe it's not happening, the timing is just as important as the thing that you are praying for because the right thing at the wrong time is still the wrong thing. And I just want to say this to you today. Be patient. Be patient for the promises of God. Position yourself. Maybe God has laid a dream on your heart to do something in the future, to do something incredible. This is one thing that I, I, if I could equip you with as a pastor to see the promises of God come to fruition in your life. Put yourself in a position emotionally, put yourself in a position spiritually, put yourself in a position financially that where whenever God says go, you can go. Because when you position yourself, I've seen it time and time and time again, where God has called somebody to do something incredible for his name. And then all of a sudden the time comes and God says go, but they can't. Because maybe they're just in mega loads of debt, or maybe they just got some crazy things going on with their family situation. They haven't stewarded their family well and in the right way, or they just made some decisions that were just bad decisions, and they can't go when God calls them to go. The right thing at the wrong time is still the wrong thing. That's why we've got to position ourselves that when the right time comes, we can go, and we can move when God wants us to move. See, there's always God's plan, God's plan, and then there's always God's timing for that plan. This is why we must spend time worshiping God. We've got to spend time getting closer to God. God, I worship you. God, I worship you mentally. I worship you physically. I worship you emotionally. I, I, I give you everything that I am. I worship you. Psalm 73, 16 through 17, it says, I tried to understand it all. But it was too hard for me. You ever been in that position before? I mean, I'm trying to understand this, but it is just, it's too hard for me. Until I went to the temple of God, the presence of God. Then I understood what was happening. See, as we continue on, I also want to ask this question about worship. What kind of worship does God love? What kind of worship does he love? What kind of worship makes God smile? The Bible is very clear that there is a right way to worship God and there is a wrong way to worship God. How do I worship God in the right way? Here's the kind of worship that God loves. God loves wholehearted worship. It can be ugly worship, but as long as it's wholehearted, God loves it. You know, you ever had them ugly cries? You know what I'm talking about? It's like, God, I just need you. You know, like, God, just help me, you know. I mean, God would love that rather than half-hearted worship. 
Just, I, I just, God's going, I just, I want your whole heart. I want every single aspect of your life because once you see that you put me first in everything, everything else is going to take care of itself. But even when you go through that bad time, I'm still God and I'm still called to be worshiped by you and to receive your glory. When you go through that good time, remember who gave you that success and prospered you in life. See, the right way to worship God is wholehearted worship. The wrong way to worship God is with insincere worship. Did you know that when you worship God with your whole heart, check this out, that he blesses you in ways that you would not normally be blessed. Check out this scripture, 2 Chronicles 31, 21. It says Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a king of Israel. It says he dedicated his life to serving God. Everything, everything, everything. I looked that word up in the Greek, everything, and you know what it means? It means everything. Everything he did in worship in God's temple, he did wholeheartedly. As a result, he was what? Very successful and he prospered. He was successful and he prospered. Hezekiah was a very successful and prosperous king in Israel. And why did God prosper him? Because he worshiped God wholeheartedly. God loves wholehearted worship. But the, also, the opposite is also true. God hates insincere worship. In fact, the Bible says it makes him want to throw up. And here's what God says about insincere worship. Isaiah 29, 13, it says, These people say that they are mine, but they honor me only with their lips. Their hearts are far away from me, and their worship of me amounts to nothing more than human traditions that they have memorized and say. Tradition says change, and then you can come be a part of who we are. Jesus says, come and be a part of who we are and what we're doing. And because you see love, because you see truth, because you see the way that you should live your life, you might just change. That's why at Vibrant Church, we're building this church for the unchurched. People that don't know God, people that are far away from God or, or haven't been to church in a long time, they are more than welcome to come and be a part of what we are doing. See, this is pretty straightforward on what God loves and hates about worship of him. Here's the last and final question I want to answer for today. How do we tell God we love him and worship him correctly? How do we do this? Let me make a quick qualification here real quick. I realize we now have podcasts, we have YouTube, we even, we even have services online. These are all great things. But the qualification I want to make today is this. Watching worship is not worship. Watching worship is is not worship. God says, hold on, we don't have to get heavy. This is going to be good. God says he wants us to come to his house and worship. Again, the perks of being connected to a local church. He says he wants you to gather together with other believers and worship. Watching worship is a great solution to staying connected short term to your church family. If you have a business trip, you go out of town, you're sick. But ultimately, God wants you to be connected to a local church where people know who you are and you know who they are. It's kind of like the old, you know, what was that old cheers, you know, where everyone knows your name. <laughs> you know? I've been on a little kick lately. Last week, I think it was Garth Brooks and some unanswered prayer song. You know, this week it's cheers. So, but God wants you in a place where everyone knows your name. At least one person does. That's why I even say, man, you don't have to come here and be like this social butterfly. You know, you can come and just get connected to one person. Because if you feel connected to one person, man, there's so much that can tra transform and change in your life when you feel like you're connected with one person that's heading in the same direction that you are, that you are. See, did you know that getting up, getting dressed, brushing your teeth, and going to church is an act of worship? In fact, Psalms 122.1 it says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let us go into the house of the Lord. So here's the first of many ways we worship God. And we're going to end with these three quick points. Here's the, the first of many ways we worship the Lord correctly. Number one is this, by singing to him. It's by singing to him. Psalms 32, 11, it says, Celebrate God, sing together, everyone, all of you with honest 
hearts, with honest hearts. The second way we worship the Lord correctly is this, by talking to God together in prayer. Yes, you can talk to God anytime you want to by yourself in prayer, but did you know that there's actually added power? There's added power when you and me, when two are gathered in my name, God says, I will be there in the midst of you. The presence of God is with us here today. That's why as I'm talking, you're thinking about scenarios and situations. It's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh, oh man, I need to do that. Or oh yeah, I didn't do that. Or oh man, I need to go talk to that person. The Holy Spirit, God is speaking to you today. But we're called to, to talk to God together in prayer. That's why every year we start the beginning of the year off together with 21 days of prayer and fasting. And you know one of the most common things that I hear every year as we kind of get to the end of January? By the way, anybody in here participate in our 21 days of prayer and fasting this last year? Was it not incredible or what? Because this is the common thing I hear. Marco, I mean, it's only been like two weeks of like prayer and fasting and God already did this. God answered my prayer in this way. Man, just the closeness that I feel to God right now is just unbelievable. Why is that? Because we are all in unity as a body of Christ, and we're praying together. We're praying for each other. And we are, because this, this stage, by the way, we put prayer cards out here and we pray over your prayer request. And because we're doing this, there is added power when we are in unity praying for things. It's because we're all focused praying for each other. Acts 1.14, it says, they all join together constantly in prayer. And can I ask a favor of you, church? Whenever God lays somebody on your heart, pray for them. Maybe it's one of your coworkers. Some of you are like, oh, I'm going to pray for my coworker. All right. I tell you what, wait till Monday, wait till tomorrow. You, you don't know what happened last week. Oh, it's all, I'm going to pray for them. You know, but when God lays somebody in your heart, man, pray for them. Pray for your coworker. Pray for your boss. Pray for the people in Vibrant Church. Pray for my wife and I. Pray for each other. Because when we are together and we are praying for each other, there is added and increased power. And the hand of God can move in a mighty way. The third and final way we worship God correctly is this. Number three, by giving back some of what God has given us. See, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. Because when you love someone, you want to be generous towards them. I can remember my wife and I were dating. And when we were dating, man, I couldn't keep money in my pocket. You know what I mean? It was like, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, you want that? Pfft, yeah. I'm like made of dollar bills. You know what I mean? Like, baby, I'm, oh, you, want, you got that. It's because I just, I loved her. Man, I just wanted to give her everything, and I still love my wife, by the way. I still love my wife, by the way. I still want to give her things. But, I mean, it was like, oh, I'm in love, and, and I just, I loved her so much that I just, I wanted to give her everything that I possibly, I'd be walking in the store, and I'd be like, I'm going to get her a pair of shoes. You know, I just randomly, and buying her a pair of shoes, and stuff like that. I just, I couldn't keep money in my wallet because I loved her. So when we give back to God some of our time, our talent, our treasure, we don't give out of duty. We don't give out of pressure. By the way, let me set you free here. If, if you ever feel pressure from me, from anybody on this platform or anybody in our church to give, I, I beg you, don't. That is the wrong way to give. The way that the Bible says to give is, is to give with a cheerful heart to decide in our hearts what we want to give and give and be generous. And the reason that is so important, I don't want you to give out of an act of me twisting your arm. I want you to give to the Lord out of an act of love for him. Because at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. My job and my role is to point you to God and you to worship and give him the glory that he deserves. See, giving is an act of worship. Many, many think that, man, bringing our tithe to God or, or giving an offering is something we're just supposed to do. No, when we tithe, it's an act of worship to God. When we give over our tithe as an offering, this is worship to God. One thing that I do, and, and daddies, I want to encourage you in this. One thing that I do every pay period for my wife and I is, is in the morning when I get up, by the way, our, our house goes on a spending freeze. 
uh, before nothing gets spent before we give our tithe because the Bible says the first belongs to God. The first 10% belongs to God. And dads, let me just encourage you in something. Maybe you're writing that tithe check. Uh, maybe you're giving online. Uh, maybe you're giving an offering to the church. Maybe you're giving an offering to somebody. Uh, one of the things that I love to do is I say, Austin, my son, I say, son, come here. And I sit him down and, and I give online. And I sit him in my lap and I say, you see that? Everything we have comes from God. And the Bible says to bring our tithe. We, we don't give our tithe. Tithing isn't generosity. Tithing is obedience. We bring our tithe to the storehouse. Son, you see this? This is 10% that we're giving back to God in obedience to him because we worship God in everything that we do. Son, don't ever forget that God can do more with the 90% than we can with the 100%. And as a Johnson, we worship the Lord with our tithes and our offering. You know what we do? We hit the submit button together. Because at a young age, I want to show him what it is to be obedient and to worship God.